Good, okay. Good morning. We are here. Welcome to Cascadia Church. We uh, have checked in. We've prayed. We've got our Bibles open, bulletins ready with blanks to be filled. I know how you like to fill in blanks, so I'll provide some of those for you this morning. We are here today continuing in our series called Route 66. Today we're at uh, Exit 44, so to speak, the book of Acts in the New Testament. We just finished all four Gospels, and at the end of every Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples to go into the world and make disciples. Keep the message going forward, help others to come to faith, grow in the faith, multiply, expand. And we're going to see today in the book of Acts how that began. So if you know Christ is your Savior, uh, I think it's important to remember uh, that the message of the gospel did not come to you accidentally. Uh, and it didn't come to me just by chance either. God sovereignly worked in my life, and if you know Christ, he sovereignly worked in your life to bring you to a point where you knew you needed Jesus in your life. Often, as we will see, people come to faith in Christ in, a, in the midst of a crisis. We'll see that that uh, is, a, is a pattern, not necessarily a prescription, but it's a pattern. And it's important for us to remember, as I said, that the gospel came to us intentionally. It came to us sacrificially many people many many people laid down their lives to make sure that the freedom to continue to share the gospel was maintained the gospel came to us strategically there were hundreds of faithful generations that brought the message of Christ to others once they had received him themselves and it's our turn now we're standing on the shoulders of hundreds of generations. It's our responsibility now to take that message to the next generation so that future generations to come, generations not yet born, will have an opportunity to hear about Jesus in the same way that we did. And that's really what the book of Acts is all about. Taking the gospel from where you are to where it needs to go, wherever we might be. So, it's our turn. Let's take a look at the book of Acts. Let's do a little bit of preview before we jump into the content of the book. Uh, we, I like to summarize the book in 10 words or less. This is not original with me. Uh, you see on your supplemental sheet that I give credit where credit is due. And here's one way of summarizing the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit's arrival heralds the beginning of the church. And a walk through the Bible provides these graphics for us. Some of you have seen this already. And I put this out on Facebook uh, and asked people, guess which book of Scripture we're looking at this week. Some could decipher. Some were not able to do that. What do you see prominent? Acts. Okay, there's a big clue. And uh, carved out of this tree, a church. So the book of Acts is about the church. How it began and how it continues to grow and continues to spread. The theme of the book of Acts is the witnesses, because it comes right out of one of the early verses in chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. They want to know, the disciples want to know, Jesus, are you going to set up your kingdom right now? Is this what we've been waiting for? And he says, nope, that's going to come later. But until then, here's what I want you to do. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the earth. What is a witness? A witness is somebody who simply repeats what I saw, what I heard, what happened, what happened to me, what happened to other people. And Jesus said that his followers, including us, will be his witnesses. And what I think is interesting is he says you're going to start in Jerusalem, where we are right now at this moment. And then you're going to go to Judea, Samaria, and even into the remotest part of the earth. Look at these keywords: Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the earth. That is essentially the outline of the book of Acts. The outline is geographical, and it's cultural and is shown right here uh, in this verse for example the gospel witness 
spread geographically from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 to Samaria and Judea in Acts chapter 8 and then to the remotest part of the earth spreading beyond those close regions to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 10 through 28. So most of the book, 10 through 28, is how the gospel got out of the land of Israel and into the rest of the world. However, our time this morning is going to be focused on the first portion of the book of Acts. Because I want to show you a pattern that repeats itself early in the book, and it continues on throughout the rest. So we're going to go all the way up until just prior to the Apostle Paul's ministry, which is the majority of the book of Acts, but I want to set a foundation for us. And that pattern continues throughout the book. You'll see it when you read through the book of Acts. Now the gospel, well here's a little map I put together for you so you can see that the gospel started in Jerusalem. And as chapter 1, verse 8 says, it would spread to Samaria and Judea. Samaria is up a little bit north. Judea is roughly south of Jerusalem. And then eventually into the remotest part of the earth, all the way over to Auburn, Washington, where we are here. All right. Now, the gospel witness also spread culturally. It spread geographically, and it spread culturally it started with the Jews in Acts chapter 2, and it went to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. The Samaritans are some of those Jewish people that returned from the Babylonian exile and intermarried with other nations around them. You know, the people in Judea and the rest of Israel stayed pure in their relationships, and so the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along real well. Uh, however, the, Jesus died for the Samaritans as well. And he rose for the Samaritans as well. And the gospel came to Samaria. Jesus did ministry in Samaria. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And then the gospel came to God-fearers in Acts chapter 10. A God-fearer is a non-Jew, a Gentile, who practices Judaism. And there's an example in Acts chapter 10, a man named Cornelius, who was the first strictly non-Jew who was converted to Christianity. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles, those who had no Jewish connection at all, in Acts chapter 16. So Acts chapter 2, 8, 10, and 16. Remember those four numbers because those are pivotal moments in the advance of the kingdom of God, the advance of the gospel from Jerusalem to the rest of the world. All right, let's start with Jerusalem. And you'll fill in some blanks on your notes if you have them on the bulletin there. And then when we get into Judea, Samaria, the remotest parts, I don't have an outline for you on that because just to, to, to conserve space on the paper. But you see the pattern is the same. And you can find room in the margins if you'd like to to add a little bit of inf information on your, your opportunity to be creative. I'm creatively tapped this week, so it's, it's your turn. Let's start with Jerusalem. All right, so the gospel witness in Jerusalem. Here's a part of the pattern that begins. Something unusual happened. And in this case, something unusual happened in the temple. Now, the Jewish people were in Jerusalem to observe Pentecost. They were required to go to Jerusalem to observe that feast, that national holiday, which is a symbolic of the beginning of the harvest uh, for the crops and so forth, but it's also the beginning of the spiritual harvest as well. So uh, we read here in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. That they are 120 of Jesus' followers who were told to stay here and pray and wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now in the scriptures, the Spirit of God is symbolized in several ways. Water, fire, and wind is another one. And in here, uh, this sound of this rushing wind was filling this house, but those in the temple area heard it as well. So this was highly unusual. 
And the people who were in the temple for their traditional worship service uh, were, were puzzled. And they wanted to know what was happening. And so here's the next part of this principle. The gospel was made understandable to the listener. And I find this fascinating here in verse 6. When the sound occurred, that wind, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Hearing who speak? Peter and the other disciples. They began proclaiming the gospel. This is what the prophets had foretold. That the Spirit of God would be poured out among all people. And that is possible now because Jesus has been glorified. We talked about that last week. And Peter now begins to preach the gospel. That Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of all people. And he rose from the dead. And if you believe, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of eternal life. What's interesting as you can see here at the bottom, the miracle so much was not speaking in tongues. The miracle was hearing in tongues. Because it says here that every person heard in their own, in literally dialect. So if there were people there from Texas, they would hear a Texas dialect. There would be a draw, draw, and then Peter would be saying, y'all, and those kind of things. Well, actually, if there's a large group, you would say all y'all, right? That's how you do the plural of y'all. If people were from uh, the Bronx, it would sound a little bit different than it did to those who were from Texas. That's the point. Uh, there's, this, there's a language difference, even in Galilee. Remember when Peter was being questioned at the fire there when Jesus was being tortured. I recognize you. You're from Galilee. Well, how did she recognize him from Galilee? His dialect. A little variation in the way that he spoke. And so every, the gospel was made clear in vocabulary that every person understood. And then people believed when they heard the gospel. Those who had received his word, who said yes to the message of Jesus Christ, were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of conversions for a first time preaching. That's a pretty good return on investment there. Now some say, how can so many people be baptized at once? Is this water baptism? Is this spirit baptism? I think it's water baptism. Just back in May, some of us in this room were in Jerusalem, where I believe the book of Acts, this, this event in Pentecost, took place. Uh, sitting on the southern steps uh, that lead up into the temple area. I think this is where Peter was preaching. Uh, I think this is where people heard him preaching. And the question is, how can so many people be baptized at a place like this? Around these steps, in fact, Jesus walked up those steps to, that we were sitting on. Around those steps are 48, what are called mikvaot, or a mikvah, which is a, a, like a pool. You can see the photo here. And on this side here, there's steps going down and a little barrier that's been decayed and broken. This is a couple thousand years old. And then another set of steps coming up out of the water. Jewish people, when they would come to the temple to worship, they would cleanse themselves. They would bathe. They would go into this mikvah, wash, come out, and then go up. To, uh, to worship. 48 of these, and I just want to show you how close this is to the steps where Pentecost occurred. It's just literally a few steps away from where this event happened. Very easy, very reasonable to draw the conclusion that the people that heard the gospel were baptized. Why? Because they wanted to demonstrate that there's a different kind of cleansing that they had just experienced. It's the forgiveness of sins. It's the Spirit of God within them. Jew, um, baptism was a Jewish practice. 
The going in and out of the water all the time for ritual cleansing was called baptism. Anybody who converted to Judaism was baptized. John was baptizing in the Jordan River as a Jewish prophet for people to demonstrate that they wanted to be prepared for Messiah who would come. Baptism is a good thing. It's a good practice that people still observe to demonstrate forgiveness, washing away of sins, and so forth. In fact, <clears throat> when we're done today, when we go into flock talk, uh, because we're doing the book of Acts right now, we're going to show some of the photos from our trip. And you'll see a picture of Kathy Jones. Kathy's not here this morning, is she? Okay. Uh, where she got baptized on our trip. You'll see that in just, just a few moments. All right. We read that there were 3,000 who were converted. Here's something that I think is also fascinating about this experience. The Jewish people today still have a liturgy for synagogue Bible reading. Their Bible is the Old Testament. And that reading schedule is the same as it was back in the time of Jesus and even before. And so every day, the Jews have a portion of Scripture that is a daily Bible reading. On the day of Pentecost, the assigned reading, which has been there for thousands of years, is in Exodus 32, where Moses went up onto the mountain to receive the law. And if you know about that episode... Moses is up spending time with God and the people down below and the foot of the, the base of the mountain are rebelling. They built this golden calf and they're worshiping this calf and God sent Moses back down to put an end to that. Well, God was extremely angry and there was a consequence. Do you remember what happened to some of those who are worshiping the calf? God killed them. He took their lives. Here's what... Deuteronomy 32, 28 says, these people would have heard this verse read that morning prior to the Spirit of God coming. About 3,000 men of the people fell that day. They had just heard earlier in the morning how 3,000 people died. A few short hours later, 3,000 people came to life. Spiritual life. I think it's fascinating how that is a part of the experience. Okay. It's how the gospel came to Jerusalem. Now let's discover how the gospel began to go into Samaria and Judea because Jesus said that's where we want the gospel to go. Now, Christians have a habit of huddling and staying in safe places. Uh, we don't have assigned seats here at Cascadia Church, but we have assigned seats at Cascadia Church. You all sit in the same place every week. <laughs> you know that? Yeah, you do. Now, I know what's going to happen next week. Yeah, you're going to move around a little bit and throw me off. Yeah, that's fine. We also have a tendency to, to just really enjoy uh, you know, being together and knowing each other. And it's a little difficult sometimes to welcome in new people. And they're not, not to be that way. And so God sovereignly got the church in Jerusalem off their heels, out of their seats, and out into Judea and, and Samaria, where they were supposed to go with the gospel. They weren't doing it at this point. So something unusual happened. To the church. We read in chapter 8, verse 1. We did chapter 2, next big chapter is 8. A great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered where? Throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, right where Jesus told them to go. So they're going out from Jerusalem into Judea and into Samaria. Let's take a look at the gospel witness in Samaria. The gospel, as in Jerusalem, was made understandable to the listener. We see as Philip is preaching the gospel, the crowds were paying attention with one mind. They were focused intently on what he was saying and uh, to what was being said by Philip. The paying attention with one mind. They were locked in because they wanted to understand and then people believed when they heard the gospel. 
when they believed Philip as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were being baptized. Same thing we saw in Jerusalem. Same thing. Now the gospel also went down south into Judea. An angel, and so something unusual happened to Philip. These are, these are not normal experiences. These are not normal things. These are not routine experiences. An angel of the Lord, chapter 8, verse 26, spoke to Philip saying, Get ready and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Here it is on the map. Gaza on the bottom right. You ever heard of the Gaza Strip? That's it. So there's a road that goes from Jerusalem down into Gaza. And the Spirit of God told Philip, get on that road and start walking south. And he didn't question or hesitate. He just obeyed. And it came across a man who was reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, about the suffering servant. And Philip made the gospel understandable to that Ethiopian, that African man. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? Now there's an open door. And so Philip was faithful. And he climbed into the chariot with this man and began to talk to him about Jesus. So we read that right here. Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture, Isaiah 53. He preached Jesus to him. It's remarkable how they could use the Old Testament, that's all they had, to preach about Jesus. And so people believed when they heard the gospel. Same thing we saw in Jerusalem and in uh, Samaria. Uh, chapter 8, verse 36 says, they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? The same pattern. The same demonstration of faith. So we see Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Gaza. The gospel is beginning to spread. It's beginning to grow. And I want to show you also Joppa, just south of modern-day Tel Aviv, and Caesarea up on the coast. Uh, those two cities come into play in Acts chapter 10. 2, 8, 10. It's another big transitional moment in uh, the church. Something unusual happened to Cornelius. <clears throat> there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius. He clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, your prayers and charitable gifts have ascended as a memorial offering before God. And the angel gave him continued instructions, send people down into Joppa and go get Peter and bring him back because he's going to help you understand more about Jesus. And so at the mean in the meantime, something unusual happened to Peter. Peter became hungry and he's down in Joppa. He's down south on the coast. Peter became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky opened up. And an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by the four corners to the ground. And all there were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And the point of this vision is, Peter, as a kosher Jewish man, was not allowed to eat the kinds of animals that were being lowered down on this sheet. And he was told to eat, and Peter says, I don't do that. And the Spirit of God, the, the angel is saying, you will now. And then the message is, the gospel is not only for the clean Jews, but for the unclean Gentiles. And there's a Gentile man who worships God, your God, our God, up in Caesarea waiting to hear from you. And Peter said, I'll do it. And Peter went up there. And the gospel was made understandable to the listener. Peter said this, God ordered us to preach to the people and to testify solemnly that Jesus is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify of him, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And then people believed when they heard the gospel. 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. I've seen this myself, talking with people about Jesus, those who don't know him. I'm sharing the gospel. I'm talking about what it means to believe, and I can see when the lights turn on. And I asked them, I said, sometimes I'll ask the question, I said, it just happened, didn't it? Yeah, I believe. And you, you can see sometimes just this transformation when the Spirit of God falls upon them. Listen, it's not the prayer of salvation that saves, it's belief, it's faith in Jesus Christ that saves. And let me just challenge you with this. How can you pray a prayer of salvation without having first believed that salvation is something that you need and something that you want and you're receiving right now? The prayer is a good thing, but it's not the prayer that saves, it's the faith that saves. All right, here's a couple of witness principles in the book of Acts, and we're going to wrap it up. Here's some blanks for you to fill in, so time to wake up, find your pen or pencil. A couple of witness principles in the book of Acts. Unusual events signal prime opportunities to be a witness. Unusual events. Um, these could be schedule interruptions, crises, blessings, sometimes the birth of a child or the or a death of a sibling. Anything that is not usual can be a transitional moment, an unusual event, and I would just encourage you uh, to be aware of promptings from the Holy Spirit to be a witness when people are in crisis or when there's a transition in their life. Uh, here's, here's another principle. People are responsive to the gospel in times of crisis. This is why my funeral ministry is so fruitful spiritually. I remember when I was in seminary down in Southern California, I took an evening class in Watts, L.A. And I noticed eventually that whenever there was a siren, whether it was a, a squad car or an aid car or a fire truck, there were several African Americans who were in that class. I'd kind of glance out of the corner of my eye and these men had their heads bowed and they were praying. Why? Somebody's life is changing right now. Somebody's in a crisis. And I talk with my friends in the class and I say, yes, we pray for those family members. We pray for first responders, especially those who know Jesus. We pray for the police and fire chaplains that they would bring Jesus to those people who are in crisis. And I've adopted that habit myself. I hear sirens all the time up on the hill where we live, just up over Auburn. And it's not a bad habit to develop, to realize that people are in crisis, they're in transition, and they're looking for help, they're looking for hope. We need to remember that. And then quickly, we're just gonna walk through a witness pattern in the book of Acts, and then we're gonna we're going to wrap this up. Uh, just think about a couple of examples. The apostle Paul, who used to be Saul, he was converted in a crisis moment. The Philippian jailer was converted in a crisis moment. And others as well. Okay. A couple of witness patterns in the book of Acts. The church was faithful in their verbal witness. I've heard people say, and it's kind of cute, I hope you don't believe it, preach the gospel to all creation and if necessary, use words. No. Use words. Use words. The content of the message always remained the same throughout the book of Acts. Always. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And he came to save you. He came to forgive your sins. And you need to repent. Change your mind, change your life, receive Jesus Christ. Every presentation was contextualized. What I mean by that is the way that Peter presented the gospel to Cornelius was not the same way that Philip presented the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. The way that Peter preached in Jerusalem was not the same way Paul preached in Ephesus. But they all preached the same message. The, the style, even the dialect, and some of the vocabulary was picked up from the culture and adopted into the presentation of the message. So every style of presentation was unique, 
Nobody memorized an outline. Nobody memorized illustrations. Nobody memorized a program of evangelism. They knew Jesus. They knew what happened to them. They knew what can happen to others. And they were a witness. Here's my story. Here's what happened. How about you? People responded to the gospel. And some did not. Well, they did, but in a negative way. And then finally, the Spirit powerfully worked through faithful people. Faithful people. That's how the church grows. Faithful believers who are a witness to an unbelieving community. That's how the church grows. Just real quick, I just want to show you what the rest of Acts is all about. Just through four simple little graphics, four simple little maps. Paul, maps. The Apostle Paul had three missionary journeys and one final journey to Rome. And so his first one, he started in Antioch, just north of Jerusalem and Israel there. <clears throat> Traveled into the southeast, Asia Minor. In his next journey, he expanded a little bit, went over into Greece. His third journey, essentially the same route, went back to visit some of these churches again and strengthen the churches that were there, still planting churches, still evangelizing, and so forth. And then his final journey to Rome from Jerusalem ended up going over into Rome. And there's a lot of information in the rest of the book of Acts about chapter 11 up through 28. And uh, I'm going to encourage you to read it this week and look for these patterns that we talked about this morning. So uh, here's our takeaway for today. Uh, I will be a faithful witness. Now Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when the Spirit of God comes upon you when you're converted, you will be my witnesses. Some are faithful and some are not. Some are effective and some are not. Some are good witnesses, some are poor witnesses. It depends on who we want to be and what we want to do. We want to be faithful witnesses, and we'll talk about that uh, during Flock Talk today. So uh, we encourage you, if you're not, if you're local and you're not in church, come here, you know, and participate in Flock Talk. with. I, we like Flock Talk, don't we? Yeah, okay. Yeah, both of you said yes. <laughs> okay, more than, more than both, for sure. Okay, we will get into some of that a little bit later on. We're, getting, we're, we're out of time, and uh, we're going to pray. We're going to sing a little bit, take a little break, and then we've got much to do during Flock Talk, including this. Uh, I just got back with some from our church on a tour of the Book of Acts on location. We started in Jerusalem, and we ended up in Rome just like the Apostle Paul did. So we're going to show you some photos from that trip during, during uh, Flock Talk. And uh, our Facebook friends are going to miss that, unfortunately. So this is why you need to be here if you want to see those photos. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the beginning of just looking at uh, a foundation for the book of Acts. There's so much more here. And just like every other book, when we survey it so quickly, uh, we just need to touch on some of the highlights or some of the unique dimensions to each one of the books. And so, no exception here with Acts. And we see this pattern of witness effectiveness beginning in Jerusalem. That's how the gospel came to Auburn. That's how we, those of us who know Jesus, know Jesus. It's because hundreds of faithful generations in the past brought the message to the next generation. As, as, as I said earlier this morning, it's our turn now. There are future generations depending upon us to be faithful. That is our divine assignment. And so, Father, equip us to be more effective, uh, more faithful in doing that as we continue on this morning. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye. And then we're going to sing for just a little bit. So Ashley is not here this morning. She's